grateful to be right before supper <laughs> at 5.05 when the Seahawks are playing. It's uh, good to have good competition. You know, we talk about our schools being in a competitive environment. I feel like I'm in a competitive environment now. So uh, we'll, we'll see if we stay awake long enough to eat supper. I, I was reminding myself that I first came to NWAIS uh, in 2005, at which point I think it was called PNAIS. Is that right? It was. <laughs> so everything changes in order to meet the needs of the time. Uh, I'm here to bring sweetness and light. We are in difficult times, challenging times, complex times, and we can expect nothing but good as we look forward. We can have every hope that we will be successful, that our schools can remain full, and that we will continue to be attractive in the marketplace. Okay, let's have some. <laughs> so, what, is, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, are there any people in the room who don't know about ISM? I just want to know if I need a, a short intro. No, you all know about us? Okay, good. That saves time. So, when we think about private independent schools, we know that, and Amada just showed us some great data, we, we know that some schools are declining, some schools are rising, and some schools are staying the same. We think at ISM that we are in an educational paradigm shift where executive leadership, what you do as heads of school, matters a lot in terms of the success of your schools. So when we talk about a paradigm shift, it's easy to go, oh yeah, 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 things are always changing. That's not what we mean. We mean that there are moments, epochal moments in history, and a very tiny number of them in education, where something moves. You think about the invention of writing at the time of Socrates, the invention of the printing press in the 15th century. These were epochal mo moments that changed the way in which we thought about education, the way in which education was delivered, and the way in which children were given the experience of education in a whole bunch of different ways. There were two of the latest educational changes were at the beginning of the 19th century with the invention of the blackboard which allowed us to implement a Prussian system of education that all the great edu educators went across the University of Berlin to examine, which was designed to create an identical and compliant citizenry in order to serve in conscript armies and die instead of run away. The Prussians were deeply embarrassed about their efforts in the Napoleonic Wars. There were many Many too many live soldiers at the end of it. They needed a lot more dead ones to salvage their national honor. And to meet the needs of the factories as they were growing up, which required repetitive tasks, continued over large periods of time, 8, 10, 12, 14 hours, until the labor laws began to come in. So that was one dramatic shift. The other dramatic shift through the 19th and 20th centuries was to include more and more people in what we thought of as being educable. So at the end of the 18th century, we basically thought that rich white men were educable. If you were an educated woman, you were either insane or sterile. <laughs> there are loaded tomes to demonstrate the truth of that. The 19th century, we thought that the evidence behind that seemed a little weak. And so we decided that women had brains. We decided that poor people had brains. You see, we didn't have any choice because we needed them to read instructions in the factories. We decided eventually that people of color had brains. 
We decided in the 20th century that people who were handicapped, both physically and mentally, had brains. We decided that gypsies had brains. And so we've uh, recently, of course, we've been talking about sexual orientation and different kinds of families. And so we've been including more and more people in the educated classes. But the system of education, as we went through that time, didn't fundamentally change. It was what we think of as the old paradigm. The old paradigm was symbolized by this schedule. This is from a 1919 yearbook. Some of you may recognize it. <laughs> this was the identical schedule to the one that I had in the 60s as I grew up. And it's the identical schedule to a school I was at two weeks ago. Except they had added another period. <laughs> to make it more rigorous. <laughs> So the old paradigm was very, very interesting. When we, as a research company, constantly ask kids questions, and always the same questions, so we get good data analysis, one of them is, to high schoolers specifically, do you do homework in one class for another class? On average, 50 to 70, 80 percent of your high schoolers are doing homework in one class for another class. Of that percentage, a significant number, this was actually low at this particular school, it was only 6%, a significant number are doing it on a daily basis. That's a direct product of this schedule, the old paradigm. I remember doing that in the 60s. I also did homework in one class for another class. So when we think about that old paradigm, the features that we sold, and some of us continue to sell, are these three features. We're tough. Really tough. I mean, unpleasantly tough. You can be assured that in our school, no student will smile from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, not in my class. I think about the school I was at where I was assured by the chemistry teacher that at the beginning of every junior year, she looked at the assembled students and said, 30% of you are going to fail. Cool. 30%. That's sort of a wow, isn't it? I'm paying $20,000 for a 70% chance of success. That's really interesting. And what we suggested was that through this tough education, which included the notion that we had smaller classes than anybody else, which is included in that idea of individualization, personal attention, that we would get these results, that we would get these results. And in that old system of that old paradigm, we decided that education was based on the amount of time I spent sitting in a desk, which had nothing actually to do with education, it had everything to do with pensions. How are we going to define a professorship? That's pretty cool, isn't it? We still are doing this. We still are doing this today. Public schools are based on the 120 hour unit. We constantly are thinking about that number of hours. The 180 day year is based on the 120 hour unit. All of these things. And you go, what's the connection between these things and education? What, 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 is it, what does it mean? And when we think about the word rigor, uh, those of you who subscribe to Ideas and Perspectives will, will note that this is a word that we have particular dislike for, maybe even stronger words like detestation, and <laughs> throwing upness. <laughs> other aspects of rigor, that we, we say, well, what does that mean in the context of your school? And typically what it means when we talk to faculty is more, more. What's the difference between an honors English class and a regular English class? I'm always fascinated by the word regular. 
<laughs> you know, my grandmother used to call that potty talk. <laughs> but the difference is that instead of reading three novels, we read six novels. Really? How does that equate to better education? It certainly equates to rigorous education, but how does that equate to better education that I did more? What does that mean? Does that mean, as is true, that in our society, speed equals intelligence? If you are fast, then you're going to get ahead. Well, we add to that the idea of high standards. Rigorous schools are full of high standards. So this is a school I was in this year, and this was in their handbook. <coughs> This is how this school gets high standards. It gives out a lot of zeros. So at the end of the year, a student under this regimen, under this regimen, might end up with a C and be a brilliant 36 ACT, ATC, A, A, what is it? A something. ATC. ACT, ACT. My, my son just did it. Maybe a brilliant 36 on, a, on the ACT, 2200, well, I guess it's 1500 now on the SAT, and still get a C. Why? Because he showed up late. So what does that mark actually represent? So in the old paradigm, I love this one, while in suspension, suspension. so you're suspended for three days, everything that you should have done in those three days that you're not there to do because we kicked you out, you get a zero for it. Because it's your fault you weren't there to do the job, to do the work. Wow, that's really cool. This is, a, this is an actual handbook, actual handbook. This is what happened uh, in terms of small class size. This is the old paradigm. I'm not suggesting anybody in this room does this. It's the old paradigm that we have been engaged in this warfare with the public school system around class size. And back in the 50s, our class sizes were actually higher than the, than the public schools. When I talk with faculty, they say, our classes are too large. I say, what's your average class? And it all depends. For some of them it's 10, for some it's 18, for some it's 22. It doesn't matter, it's just what's the norm in their school. Whatever the norm is, is too large. I said, what would be the ideal class size? Oh, well, if I had no students, I'd get great results. <laughs> Tough to have a conversation, but... So this idea about class size has been very interesting, too, because I don't think we educated idiots back in the 1950s. How many of you were educated in the 50s or 60s? Yes, sorry. <laughs> you were in very large classes at a time when we didn't know about critical thinking. We only invented critical thinking as a 21st century skill. Uh, creativity too. There was no creativity, critical thinking, and unfortunately you were in a large class. That means you obviously are an idiot. What can we say? I, I did have the pleasure of receiving a, an email from the college board two years ago that said that they had seen the light and they were going to add critical thinking to the SAT. Wow. Finally. That sort of summarizes everything that ISM thinks about the college board. <laughs> so here's, here's an interesting thing about class size. What is the research behind one size of class and another size of class? It's interesting, I, I was uh, uh, looking through a box. I, I do that occasionally. And I found my old elementary school report card. I have no idea why I still have it. It's a complete accident. I'm not a collector. I tend to throw things out with gay abandon. And I thought, oh, I wonder, because I, I seem to have a vague memory that it always had the class size, how many kids were in the class. So I looked. My class sizes I went through elementary school were an average of 47. An average of 47. <laughs> As you can see, it turned me into a blithering idiot. <laughs> so that's one piece of the old paradigm. One of the great changes that's happening is that in the midst of that old paradigm, 
is the fact that when we look at the student today, the student has changed. And you would have to think about this in relationship to your own school. I often go into schools where faculty are trying to teach the student they had. I'm being serious. I'm not being negative about faculty. I'm just saying that they are still trying to think about that student that was existing in 1990. And so what we often now say to faculty when we go into schools is there is nobody here who is more than a 10-year experienced faculty member. Everything before 2005 doesn't count. Doesn't count. I taught for 26 years. If I went back to teaching, I would be redundant. I would have to reinvent outside of the personal stuff. Human beings are still human beings. Everybody with me? Outside of that, everything else I would have to reinvent and rethink and relearn. Everything. These students are in a social scenario which is completely different from the way it used to be. Let me, let me give you an illustration. Students today are often critiqued for the amount of time that they spend on social media. They're always on their phones, we say. They're always playing games. They're always distracted. It's hard to get them and then just fill in the end of the sentence. But what we find is that students today are forced to be on social media, and I use the word forced advisedly, because their parents will not allow them to do anything. It's a peculiar phenomenon common only to the United States. Not true in Canada, not true in Europe. I have no idea about other parts of the world but I find it hard to imagine that it's true elsewhere either. But our parents, for all kinds of uh, reasons, most of them fallacious, we live in the safest time in history. And it's getting safer almost literally by the decade. If you're interested, read Steve Pinker, um, a Harvard sociologist. Actually, he's an evolutionary Sociologist. They do not allow their children out of their sight. This was emphasized for me when I moved from Canada to the United States. My first summer, my wife was almost clinically depressed. I said, honey, what's the problem? She said, we have four children. She said, I know there are kids in this neighborhood. I know there are kids in this neighborhood. I said, okay, let's get in the car. Let's go find children. I was part of a research firm, right? So out we went, we drove around for an hour. We could not find a single child who was not being supervised by an adult. So it's not surprising that social media becomes a means by which our children find contact with each other which is private. It's the way they do it. There's some great research by the head of research for Google on this. And when I go to schools, I say to them, in a lot of different ways, how happy are your children? And after the obligatory, all our children love coming to school, <laughs> as we start to get into the more intimate details of what happens at school, there's a lot of stuff that begins to emerge. And I'm not saying that to be critical of schools, I'm saying it can be descriptive, to be descriptive. This is not simple stuff. And so one of the questions we ask is, in our schools, under the old paradigm, what we wanted were winners and losers. That was the whole idea. Our whole education system in the old paradigm was to establish people who won and people who didn't. People who got to university and people who didn't. People who made it into leadership and people who didn't. And sometimes in our schools, we hide behind the average without thinking about the idea of every child. This is going to be impossible for you to see. So let me just do a little descriptor of what this is. We have something we call the Student Experience Survey. It comes out of research we did in 
It's a series of 12 questions that we asked students. And we correlated against the faculty culture survey. Anybody here use these two surveys? Yeah, so several people use these surveys. Ask them, ask them about them. And it, it correlates the, what the faculty think of the faculty and what the students actually experience. It's, it's pretty interesting stuff. And this is just one of those questions. You can see the question. This is an array split by 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, and female, male. And this top one is, this is not true of me at all. This is exactly true of me. In other words, this is true, I never hear or see unkind behavior. I always see or hear unkind behavior. Now the mean looks pretty good. The mean looks pretty good. But now I want you to think about this data array in terms of winners and losers. Here are the people who love your school. They come to school, they're bouncy, they're excited, they walk in, they're having a great, great, great time. Here are the people who are having an okay time. Probably depends on the day. In fact, their response to this questionnaire probably depended upon the day. Here are the people who experience social pressure in a way that makes them feel extraordinarily badly. Winners and losers. Winners and losers. We could create exactly the same kind of thing. This is a data array from a school I was at recently. Here are the GPA winners and losers. These are the people at the top. 2400, SAT, ACT, 35, got into Rice. This is the top group of students. Here's the bottom group. The bottom group. 1550 means you're college and career ready. This is a college prep school. And four students, and there are more above it, four still students didn't make that call. They came to a school that made a promise to them, made a promise to them about mission delivery, and it didn't happen. This is the old paradigm. This is the old paradigm. The average is okay. The average is okay. So long as our average is good, then we're good to go. <coughs> so when we think about that old paradigm, that's what is connected to enrollment, we believe. Not the demographic outside of unique circumstances, certainly not wealth. Wealth is increasing considerably in this country. It's connected to what are you doing for my child the guarantee is that you deliver a mission which has a value that I cannot get elsewhere. That's the key question. That's the key question. And the answer in the 21st century is that we are losing students to, as Amada said, the competition. Whatever that competition happens to be. And here's the thing. The public schools are getting better. They cannot, let me say this, they cannot compete with your mission. It's impossible. They're not set up to do that. But they are getting better at the core job, at the core job of sending kids to college. So in 1970, only 34% of those who graduated went to college. Only 34%. That 34% constituted mostly private independent schools as a percentage. Last year, over 80% of all graduates in the United States went to college of some kind. Every school in the United States is a college prep school. Every school. It's not a distinctive as it was in 1970. So let's think about the economic situation that we face that the old paradigm cannot meet. Cannot meet. So here's our average real household income. This is the top 20%. So we draw our, and always have, always have, <laughs> NAS and ISM have been in this battle for 40 years. <laughs> We've uh, debated it around the country. That was about 20 years ago. Um, We've had conversations about it. We see no evidence that the roof is falling in that there is a cap, that there is an affordability crisis, that the business model is broken. You see no evidence for that. 
Uh, it, indeed, in the Pacific Northwest, it's pretty clear that, or I should, sorry, in the Northwest, <laughs> we see that most of your schools are in good shape. In an economy that is benefiting the wealthy. Now, if we want to get into socioeconomic politics, we may have a different conversation around the difference between the rich and the poor. But from an educational point of view, in terms of having a client base which is wealthy enough to afford our schools, it's in good shape. Indeed, the number of households that is in the middle class is dropping. That's bad news, but that's not our client base. The number of households that are now in the upper income bracket, the number of households is increasing over a very short period of time. That's only 40 years. That's a while. So, some of you may have uh, seen this uh, if you were here earlier. I'd like you to just think, think in your mind, because we don't have very much time here. I'd like you to think in your mind about what you imagine the top three jobs were in 2015. Earning potential, career opportunities, and the number of job openings. Just think in your mind what, what they were. I'm going to give you the answer. Okay, now think in your mind what your answer would have been in 1990. Is it different? So just shout out, what would it have been in 1990? More. Okay, and what's in your mind now? Okay, so here, here are the top 25 jobs last year. As I said earlier today, I don't even recognize some of those. I have no idea what they are. I googled all of them and probably forgot what they were. I thought, oh, that's interesting, and forgot it. What's a UX designer? I looked it up. But... So when we think about what we're educating for, that old paradigm doesn't meet that. It cannot produce the kind of people that are able to do these kinds of jobs. And indeed, when we think about the workforce, we can see why that's true. This is 1901, and this is 2006. And it's just uh, exacerbated these trends since then. So it started out beginning of the century, primary, pro primary producers, primary producers. Fish, lumber, etc., etc., mining, and so on. That, as we know, has collapsed partly because some of those things are no longer relevant and largely because they've become mechanized. So what we're seeing in terms of technology taking over jobs is actually something that occurred at the beginning of the century too. The use of electricity in factories was a gigantic change in terms of uh, labor. The, move, the requirement in the 10s and 20s, 1910s and 1920s, to move to more skilled labor as all the drone jobs got tossed out because everything became electrified. The same was true in the home with electrification. It's a gigantic shift. The number one occupation now is in the service industry. We talked about medicine. Uh, we think about education, of course. Fast food, uh, entertainment is in this line. Creators. Creators. In other words, the number two job producer today is not blue collar, white collar, it's creators. That's the number two. And it's increasing. That's a wow. What kind of education enables a student to take advantage of that kind of opportunity? There's a lot more we could say about that. This is an interesting data point. If you think about the top 1%. The top 1%. So those people, I'm not sure what it would be here. In Delaware, where I live, it's about $186,000 puts you into the top 1%. What did those people major in at university? It's pretty fascinating.
fascinating, isn't it? Blew me away when I when I when I read this uh, research report. I went, wow, that blows away all my assumptions. Art, history, and criticism? Are you kidding me? Even political science and government. If you went into political science and government, 6.2% of you are going to make it into the top 1% of wealth. Now, there are lots of measures of success. This is only one of them, and maybe not the most important, depending upon your value systems. But it's an interesting one, isn't it? Here's the next set. Some ones that you would expect, but some ones that you go, philosophy and religious studies? I have a 4.3% chance of making it to the top 1%. What this says to us is that it doesn't matter at all what you major in at university. <laughs> makes absolutely no difference. You can go into anything you want and make it big time, if you want. If that's your, if that's your brothers. So again, as we think about that economic piece, that economic piece, and we think about who we, what we're preparing our children for, in terms of the workplace, I don't have time to go into some of the other stuff, but in terms of the workplace, then we also have to say so. What can we charge? And the answer is, according to the research, pretty much what you want. <laughs> That's not a very popular position. But it's pretty implacable. Here's the x-axis. This is whether tuition was raised or, in fact, whether it was decreased. The y-axis I'm sorry, I only have, I, I, I should be an octopus, shouldn't I? <laughs> Let's pretend I'm doing this. The y-axis is the percent change in enrollment. So we're putting what you charge against how many students you have. You can see that this group of schools lost enrollment. That fits the data. This group of schools increased enrollment. That fits the data too. And this group of schools, the porridge was just right. <laughs> wow. What's the correlation between that and what they did, what those schools did in terms of their tuition? Whether they raised it, kept it the same, or even decreased it? Well, let's look at decrease. Here's a group of data points down here where the board thought, hey, we know how supply and demand works. If you decrease the price, supply goes up. It works for potatoes. Why wouldn't it work for education? Whoops. Not only did they decrease the price, they also lost enrollment. However, imagine the board at these schools here. Their first meeting in September. See, told you. We decreased the price and we increased enrollment. And so it goes. And this line here represents the point at which these two are statistically mirror images of each other. And it's on the zero line. There is no connection between tuition and enrollment. We disaggregated this 28 different ways. There is no connection between tuition and enrollment. We have just carried out a further, this was 2005 to 10. We did this with a statistics firm in Washington. We just carried out a further from 2010 to 15 because we wanted to see if it continued. We did this with the same statistics firm and in collaboration with MBOA. Wouldn't it be great if it had been ISM, MBOA, and NAIS? That would have been wonderful. Um, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. I think when we work together, we, we, we get better data and we, we really forward. The, it's, it's for kids. It's about kids. We, we, we do better with our kids. And I haven't seen the results, but my president told me the conclusion is identical. There is no connection. And so some schools lose students, some schools keep the students they have, and some schools increase the number of students they have. Why? Why? So let's go back to the job place. In 
the job place to keep a job in 2016 is very different from keeping a job in 1960. My father got his job in 1951. He, um, he retired from his job in 1989, the identical job that he'd held all his life, with a guaranteed pension index to inflation and guaranteed health benefits index to inflation. He once said, you're so lucky to me. I said, really? <laughs> I said, you're kidding me, daddy. I said, you had guaranteed employment for like almost 40 years and you ended up with a golden handshake from the government. That's pretty cool. I said, I have no guaranteed employment. The expectation for a student leaving your school today is that they will be in 10 to 30 jobs, careers, in their lifetime. There is no loyalty. You join a corporation today, they say, don't expect to be with us more than two years. Just don't. You're either up or out for the kinds of things our kids are looking for. And indeed, the job of an employer today is to make you redundant. There is a almost 100% chance that models will be redundant, that sports umpires will be put out of work, paralegals, telemarketers. In fact, telemarketers, when you pick up the phone, you, you remember those calls? What do they call them now? Robo calls. Robo calls. When you call somebody to get technical assistance for your technology, I now ask, are you a robot? Because I think it's up to 60% of technical assistance is now provided by robots. Machine intelligence. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And I don't think that's scary. I think that's really cool. It provides opportunities that we couldn't have imagined. We couldn't have imagined. The amount of disposable income we have today is so much higher than when my father started working in 1951. At that point, over 80% of his income went to basics. Shelter, food, utilities. That was it. Almost no disposable income. Today, I think it's under 50% for the vast majority of people unless you're under the poverty line. It always sucks to be poor. I mean that genuinely. So, why was lawyer not on that list of top jobs? Because I don't need lawyers anymore. I run all those documents for processing and analysis through machine intelligence. The price of a lawyer dropped in half. That's allowed. What do I get when I call for assistance? Room service. I get Butler. Butler shows up at my door with my donut. <coughs> what do I get when I go for a, a burger? Now this is really instructive because this is an entirely customizable burger. Somebody was showing me, who was showing me the, was, were you show, yeah. He was showing me uh, a machine now where you go and order your, I don't know what it is, sandwich, pizza, who knows what, and you put in exactly what you want and poof, out it comes. That's amazing. This is entirely customizable. You decide whether you want onions and how many, and whether you want a tomato, or whether you want it thinly sliced, or a piece of lettuce, or this kind of lettuce. You customize it entirely. It's produced entirely by machine. This is a true, real restaurant. But look at what the owner of this restaurant says. Our device is not intended to make employees more efficient. It's meant to completely obviate them. Where is the operation of a taxi driver in self-driving cars. Why do we need them? In fact, if you think about it, if we go to self-driving cars, the entire medical system is going to be thrown into confusion. Because <laughs> we're not going to be dying from car collisions. That's interesting, isn't it? Wow. So when we go into schools, we find that, by and large, and again, I'm not suggesting I know about all of your schools here. By and large, there's not much difference school to school to school when it really comes down to it. So what's the new paradigm? The new paradigm, from our perspective, is so exciting. Because it finally offers us the opportunity to truly teach every student. To not have winners and losers. To truly have winners. And let me give you an example. 
I was watching uh, a video of Salman Khan. You all know Khan Academy. So this was uh, an address that he was giving to uh, students at MIT, which is his al alma mater. A 90 minute address. I get a little tired of TED Talks, you know, anybody can be entertained for 15 minutes. So I was watching this, but I, I wasn't really paying a lot of attention because the first 30 minutes he was telling his story, which is a great story, good shtick, um, but I'd heard it before. So I was sort of doing something else and half an ear, and then he started talking, and I actually rewound the tape so I could hear it from the beginning. This is what he said. He said that when we first started working with public schools in classes, so remember he started out as the individual, a free, this is his mission statement, it's a fantastic mission statement, a free education for anybody anywhere. Isn't that a great mission statement? Mm -hmm. That's competitive, right, for us? That's really competitive. Mm -hmm. But wow, isn't that cool? A free education for anybody anywhere. So it was all individualized. People would just sign up and, and do their own thing, largely families to begin with. But then he started working with public schools. And he says in one of his first experiences with public schools, they were working with a grade five and grade seven classes. Grade five and grade seven classes. And he said they did the pretest, so entire classes. So they did the pretest at the beginning of the year. I want you to listen really closely. And, and if you want, uh, pick up this video and um, show it to your show it to your faculty because it's so instructive. He said we did the pretest and we got the perfect. Gaussian curve, the perfect distribution of math scores. He said, my words, in the old paradigm, those were my words, he said, at the top, we would have identified those students, right at that top, right at that, where that curve is, like this, we would identify those students as needing, needing an enriched curriculum. The middle kids, this part of the curve, we would have identified as regular students. The bottom of the curve, we would have identified as needing intervention. Public schools created this great thing called RTI. Some private schools have taken it on too. It's a nice idea, but it's sort of interesting. So he said, we got this perfect Gaussian distribution. Now he said, that's what we would have done in a normal classroom. He said, but Khan Academy doesn't work that way. It's self-paced and individualized, even though we were working with classes. And so the kids carried on working with their self-paced. And he shows diagrams of the data that they collected from these students doing their math. Problems that they struggled with, problems that they didn't, defined by time spent on them, attempts made. It could all be... Uh, tracked through data, and he said, this is what we found, that the use of technology increased face time with students. So that's a little counterintuitive. We tend to think of technology as being impersonal, impersonal. But in the new paradigm, what we think of as the paradigm shift, Technology doesn't make it impersonal, it makes it more personal. And it showed the data points. So let's think of a mathematical concept split into segments of learning blocks that you need to know in order to be successful. Everybody with me? And as you go along in his data array, you can follow student X, student Y, student B, student D. And you can see green boxes, meaning they got it, they got it fast, and they got it smoothly. Two, three attempts, maybe only one. Boom, they went on to the next thing. And then all of a sudden, there's a red box. Couldn't get it, no way, no how. So they skipped it and carried on. And there were more green boxes and yellow boxes. Struggled a bit, but eventually overcame. The teacher was able to see those red boxes, go and sit with the student, and say, let's go back to this box and figure it out. It increased face time with students. Now, this is what was exciting from our point of view. He said the Gaussian curve stayed the same. The population changed constantly. Constantly. Nobody stayed at the bottom, 
Nobody stayed at the top. That is amazing. That is the new paradigm. That is saying that, actually, kids are really clever. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. About three years ago, I was working with a faculty, and I was very frustrated. Not, not with them, with me. I, I couldn't, I was, not, I was not getting through. I was talking a lot, but I wasn't getting through. We weren't communicating. And so I was about to say, let's take a break because this isn't working. You're getting frustrated, I'm getting frustrated. And I blurted out this question. I have no idea where it came from. I didn't think about it, it just came out. I said, what do you believe about your students? I want to encourage you in the new paradigm to go back to your schools and ask that question of your faculty. What do you believe about your students? Because the answer that came back was very interesting. The answer that came back was, first of all, nobody's asked us that question before. We make assumptions about our students, but we're not sure what we believe about our students. So let me give you an example. I went to a school this year, this last year, high school, middle of town, where when the students came in, so 9, 10, 11, 12 graders, when the students came in, they were supervised in a particular area. When they arrived at school, there was an area that they all went to, there was faculty member there. Then they went to class. If they had a free period, they went to a supervised study hall. When they went to lunch, there was, sort of monastically, there was a, a faculty member at the front of the lunch room with a podium like this and a, and a, and a megaphone, well, a, a, a microphone. And that's how the students spent their day. I said, what do you believe about your students? Oh, they said, we believe our students are creative, critical thinkers, leaders. They're going to go out and change the world. I mean, they truly said this. I said, wow. They said, why? I said, because I think you're scared of your, your students. They said, what do you mean? I said, I think you're scared of your students. I think you're scared that if they actually acted as critical thinkers, leaders, and creative people, that they would destroy everything in sight. I said, here are my data points. You give them no free time on their own. That's my data point. I said, what would it look like if, just to start off with, you said to the seniors, at lunch, you can go out and walk down the street and have a coffee. The whole room went like this. <gasps> I said, what do you think they're going to do? Collect bricks and walk down the street hucking them through windows? I said, what they'll do is go and have a coffee. That's what 17, 18 year olds do. I said, do you know what they do at 17 years of age? You know what they do? They drive two ton vehicles and kill a lot of people according to insurance companies. They join the Marines and are given guns and go to war and shoot people. And you supervise them eating a sandwich. I said, there's a problem with this picture. I said, do you believe in your mission? He said, yeah. I said, what do you believe about your students? What do you believe about your students? We can go all the way down to kindergarten. What do you believe about your students? I love kindergarten. I love most kindergarten teachers. Most kindergarten teachers treat their children as critical thinkers, as creative, and as leaders. You know what they do in ninth grade? In almost every school I go to, they treat them like idiots. There is no choice. There is no leadership opportunity. You're at the bottom of the pack. You have no idea how to study. You know nothing. You're a blithering idiot. You have to take compulsory courses. That's the old paradigm. You have to pay your way. Even in K-12 schools, we've educated them for nine years, but in ninth grade, <laughs> again, you get nothing. That's the old paradigm. That's adult-centered. Faculty take charge. It's all about us, not about them. Not intentionally, not intentionally. We didn't have the resources in the 20th century to be truly student-centered. We had to be adult-centered. But the magic of technology provides us with an opportunity to be student-centered and to think about education in a different way. 
to think about education in a way that doesn't buttonhole the student as a five-year-old who has to comply to a certain set of learning expectations. That takes a 14-year-old and says, because you're a 14-year-old and the hormones are growing, going crazy, you can't be trusted to do anything intelligent, etc., etc. And so when we think about academics in the new paradigm, it gets really exciting. If we get excited by kids, because academics is no longer English, math, social studies, and science, which it was in the 20th century. I love this. NWAIS only accredits schools whose primary focus is academic education. I think that's a really, really interesting sentence. And I think it's a lovely sentence if it means this. Mission delivery. Mission delivery. Because in the 20th century, foreign language was not academic. Way too much talking. Arts was not academic. All they do is paint and sing. And besides which, look at the funny clothes they wear. Phys ed was not academic. They are jocks. No brains. That was 20th century. Tell me I'm wrong. That was the 20th century I was in, and it's the 20th century that the data tells us about. In the 21st century, we know the intrinsic connection between physical activity and academic, in quotation marks, classroom success. We know the power of unstructured play. And so the requirement of recess as an academic exercise, as an academic exercise, we know the power of the fine arts to allow children to express themselves in different ways than they do through reading and writing and counting. We know that children have different abilities and that they can all be rock stars in different ways. That is exciting to us. Is that exciting to you? That is exciting. The old paradigm is not exciting at all with its winners and losers. The new paradigm suggests that speed does not equal intelligence. And that you can be slow and still intelligent. Anybody uh, watch Susan Cain? Yes, no? Okay, put her name down. Susan Cain, C-A-I-N. C-A-I-N, it's a wonderful uh, little YouTube. And her book's good. Oh, quiet. Susan Cain. Yeah. Cain. Quiet. Quiet. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. about introversion. I feel a little lovely because I'm an introvert. Yes. So it really appealed to me. But she talks about this thing about speed and slowness and, and, and what that means. And you think about that going back to Salman Khan's experience of this curve where the population constantly changed as kids accelerated and slowed down, accelerated and slowed down. You see, in the 21st century, we don't expect everybody to move at the same pace all the time. Because that's not how education happens. It only happens in Stoven sequence books that adults write. That says that October 21st, we're going to be on page 21, and October 22nd, we're going to be on page 22. The AP Biology textbook, I did the calculation on it, you have to, you have to switch a page, you have to turn a page every four and a half minutes. Every four and a half minutes. Speed is intelligence in AP Biology. So what does that talk about in terms of those people who are losers in AP Biology? Those people who don't qualify for AP Biology because they're not fast enough. We're not a fast society. That's not how our adults are experiencing society. And so Bloom's taxonomy no longer has evaluating at the top, but creating at the top. Creating. That's exciting. We can actually take seriously the idea that children can be critical thinkers and creative. We paid lip service to that in the 20th century, but we didn't want it. They were disrupted, that's what we called them. They were disrupted. We used to send them out of the room. Don't turn around, don't make a noise, don't look out of the window. Look forward, stay in your desk. In classrooms that I was in, and actually I've, I've been to one classroom in the last five years where this is still true, the desks were screwed to the floor. Yes. Yes. So, we have an opportunity in the 21st century, we're so excited about this, to make education fun. 
I got to tell you, we, we just published an article on fun. Anybody read it? Yeah, okay. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. So here was, here was the thing. We, we had a big argument in the office about the use of this word fun. And people, some people in the office were opposed to it. They said it's frivolous. And they said, we said, we said, only from an adult point of view. Because when adults construct fun, they mean not doing anything. <laughs> so we've done some research over the last year. We've said to students, what does fun look like? Because when we identify, when we ask the question, who's your favorite teacher? They constantly use the word fun. A teacher who is fun. But here's the interesting thing. They don't mean a teacher who wastes time, who plays games, who just does stuff that is not connected to the curriculum. What they mean is a teacher who has extraordinarily high standards, who works with each one of them so that each one of them can be successful, who has engaging activities where they don't go to sleep, who doesn't give them mindless things to do for homework. That's fun from a student's point of view. And so as we go down this right-hand side, fun is being engaged from a student's point of view. That's fun. Anything that's enjoyable while active, not passive. <laughs> Unlike what I'm doing to you, sorry. <laughs> doing something you're passionate about with other people, hopefully that is what we're doing at this conference. Being around kind, energetic, upbeat, this is fun from a student's point of view. You see, here's, the, here's an interesting thing that the only person who's compelled to be in a school is a student. Think about that. They are legally compelled to be in a school. This is a big deal, folks. This is a big deal. You're not compelled to be in the school. You can do something else. Your faculty are not compelled to be in the school. They can do something else. But every student in your school is compelled to be there. I was reading a case study of a student recently. It was in a, it was in a research in a in a research study where the 16-year-old was spending 60 days in jail for missing school. <laughs> I'm sure he got zeros on all his assignments. <laughs> so, I have timed this extraordinarily badly. Oh, so we want to say this, that when we think about the 21st century paradigm, when we think about the 21st century paradigm, we think that it's an extraordinary opportunity for us to truly live our mission in the life of every child in our building. Every child, not 99% of them, let alone 80%. Every child in our building. That's extraordinary. That we can have a fun time doing it, not a rigorous time. A fun time from a student's point of view. And that we can do something about the experience that children have in school. We truly believe that over 90% of student misbehavior is caused by us. We truly believe that. And we have data to back it up. We truly believe that students are not lazy. That that is a characterization that adults give students for their own failings. For their own inability to engage. For their own inability to challenge at a high enough level for every student appropriately for their own competence at that moment in their lives, whether they're charging forward or relaxing. Remember, it's not a marathon, it's a series of sprints, education. We believe that every student wants to succeed. And therefore, those students that didn't succeed, didn't succeed for institutional reasons. As my grandmother said, you can only lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. So we'll accept the possibility that occasionally a horse doesn't want to drink. We'll accept that as a possibility. But for the vast majority, they come to school to have a good time, to meet their friends, to engage with fantastic adults, their faculty, to be challenged, to be successful, to go to college, to enjoy their lives, and to have successful careers. We think we live in exciting times. There are lots of kids, there's lots of money, and there's a great future ahead for us. Thank you.